This is the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast, where we uncover the alternative investments and strategies that billionaires use to grow wealth. The tools and tactics you'll learn from this podcast will make you a better investor and help you build legacy wealth. Join us as we dive into the world of alternative investments, uncover strategies of the ultra wealthy, discuss economics, and interview successful investors. Welcome to the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. I am your co-host, Ben Frazier, joined by... Bob Frazier. And today we're going to do a podcast about inflation. So you've been hearing a lot about inflation. We've even talked about it in a past episode, breaking down what's driving inflation. And today we want to take it one step further. So a lot of investors are seeing the headlines, um, hearing about inflation. But as investors, what do we do from here? And looking back historically, we have not had periods of high inflation for a long time, really since the 80s. And so it's kind of a new concept um, to a lot of investors. And so what we want to do is look at historical data. And what Bob has done here and is going to present is looking at macro um, time periods, 10-year time periods um, and inflation numbers and what asset classes have performed the best during those time periods. We're going to talk about a host of other things, including uh, gold. Uh, we recently had a great guest on um, who runs a gold royalty company and where does that you know fit in a portfolio. Um, and we're going to talk about the national debt and is this something to be concerned about, especially in a period of inflation, how does that impact us? So, uh, those things, a lot more we're going to be talking about right now. So let's jump in. First off, um, maybe a quick recap of inflation. How do we get here? And uh, is this going to be a persistent thing we're going to see for a period of time? And just kind of give us a real quick rundown of some of the things driving it. Yeah, sure. So so we've seen pretty high inflation prints around 7.5% annualized inflation, which is fairly high. Certainly historically, that is quite high for America. It's driven, you know, well, I, I think it's important to say, first off, it is virtually an, an entirely U.S. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing uh, about half these levels of inflation in Asia and pretty much not in, in inflation in Europe. So it's it's a U.S. phenomenon and it's it's pretty much entirely stimulus driven. Um, it's uh, stimulus driven and COVID driven. Let me let me say that. So there's uh, several components to inflation, and there's some of these components are both uh, transitional. So they're they're transitory rather. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna they're gonna dissipate, but some are going to be a little bit more persistent. Um, the the transitional. So of the components, you have you have um, uh, the supply chain disruption, yep. and we think that's going to be that's going to be kind of solved, you know, this year, you know, and maybe into next year. Um, you have you have the one of the big components is demand. Um, so what's happened is because of the stimulus and other things, we have an extraordinarily healthy consumer. Now a lot of times when I'm saying that. Most people are not tracking with me <laughs> right. when I say the consumers are incredibly finan financially, fiscally healthy right now. And I, in this podcast, we're not going to go over that. But if 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 that's a question mark to you, please go go look at our previous blog post. But you see um, record high uh, uh, net income per capita, record high uh, uh, household net worth record low debt service payments as a percentage of disposable personal income, record low household financial obligations. Literally, it's historic. We have never seen a consumer this healthy before. And a lot of it has been due to transfer payments because of stimulus payments. Right. In, in the past, you know, easing, easy, the business cycle was controlled in the 80s and 90s through through basically the, mon the, the the maintaining of interest rates. So you raise interest mm -hmm. rates to cool the economy, you you chill the economy by, by lowering interest rates. Well, what happened in 2009, they created a new a new methodology called monetizing the debt or, or quantitative easing, where they actually purchased, they printed money, so to speak, uh, to purchase government debt. And in the latest installment, um, you know, in 2020, they actually did direct payments to individuals. So literally what Ben Pernanke joked about in the 90s uh, about helicopter money, what would have to happen if we actually put money in people's pockets? Well, now we know what happens. <laughs> they stand straight up 
and they start spending like crazy. And it's it's really exactly what you would expect. And there's something like six trillion dollars of cash sitting in savings accounts. Right Excess now, right? savings. Excess six savings. trillion dollars, massive amounts. And as soon as confidence increases, you're going to see that flowing into the economy. Yeah, so, so we have so, these two, two sides of both the, the supply side as well as the demand side. So supply yeah. side, there's the supply chain issues, which we're seeing. There's also the labor shortage, which we talked a lot that's, about. And that's the and, third, the third yeah. element. So, okay. so you have this, this basically uh, crushing consumer demand um, and it meets a, a supply disruption mm -hmm. and labor shortage. And a lot of the labor shortage also, unfortunately, is stimulus based. So a lot of people, when they they got their their, their wages in, yeah. increased, they got their stimulus checks, and they basically quit their jobs or retired. And you know, dual earners, uh, dual family earners, one of the one of the earners quit, that kind of thing, and others retired. So so you see a lot of people that were you just left the workforce and figured it's it's you know time to time to you know exit the workforce so all of that is this perfect storm causing inflation well some of it's persistent as we yep. pointed out so what's persistent what's going to be persistent is the consumer demand mm -hmm. um, that's going to that's going to diminish somewhat but stay strong for several years um, and these this the supply chain I believe is tra tra transitory uh, supply chain disruption, so that'll diminish. But the, cons the consumer demand is is resilient, as well as the labor shortage. It's going to be resilient. Um, so 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 we've got inflation. Our view is that inf inflation is going to remain stubbornly high, um, but probably not spike up much higher from here. Um, and but it's it's something we want to get used to. We want to one understand how it affects us and. And so what, what I've found in all the research lately is that inflation has been all, all but forgotten in, amongst research and analysts, okay? It's something that in the last you know, 30 years, we really haven't had much of. Mm -hmm. And so people have forgotten how to underwrite to it, how to invest to it, et cetera. So I want to just kind of do a little bit of review of you know, how do we really manage an inflationary uh, uh, regime and 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 inflation is not neutral. It is it is both a time to lose a massive amount of money, right. and a time to make a massive amount of money, whichever side of the coin you're on. So so right. And really, really, a whole point of this podcast is to provide education for investors and have this macro, you know, economic thesis and viewpoint and framework that we can make decisions to invest wisely. And so, looking at these these trends, we want to take it a step further with this podcast and actually look at the data and break down, you know, how have different asset classes fared um, in periods of high inflation um, historically. So let, let's maybe jump to that first um, is, you know, you've pulled a lot of data and, and some of the data is more challenging to get, especially maybe in the commercial real estate space, but we really tried to break it down as, as best we could um, into kind of a few different categories and looking at how different asset classes have, have performed. Right. So, all right, so so what we've done is just the biggest picture imaginable. I just looked at decades, and in, and in fact, inflation falls kind of neatly into decades. So you have the decade of the '70s, and it was a very high inflation. You know, Jimmy Carter years, uh, whip inflation now. You know, uh, and to the 1980s was also fairly high inflation. But by the 90s, inflation was by and large tamed. So we had, you know, in, inflation was hitting. Um, let's say in the 70s, seven and a half percent on average in the 70s. Um, during the 80s was 5.1 percent. So we're at 7.5 right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then it dropped in the 90s to 2.9 percent, 2.5 percent, and then 1.8 percent. So it's kind of been trending in the, you know, uh, right around the two range. A little right. above the two range, and so we've forgotten how to do it. So, so, so it's super important to look back in the '80s mm -hmm. and see what was what was trending well. But one of the things that we want to show is just first of all, you can see this this housing chart to show by decade. I just looked at okay, how did housing prices do relative to uh, inflation? You know, and housing was really one of the best ways to beat inflation. It beat every inflation every single decade. And so you can see from the chart, and it's not surprising. I think we've known that. But again, that's that's a really good way to beat inflation. 
and really the concept of being inflation protected, you know, we don't want to, you know, overlook what that actually means. And so when we're looking at, you know, what are asset classes that are going to perform best in inflationary periods is the, the asset class is where you have the pricing power, where that inflation can be pushed through to the end user. And so residential housing and uh, single family housing especially uh, does very well in inflation uh, because you can increase your revenue in the form of higher rents. And that is generally expected and accepted by um, renters in those periods of higher inflation. Right. And by doing that, you're actually um, increasing your net op operating income and uh, can keep up or even beat inflation. Right. And, you know, we, we can we can go to that that chart. Um, what's what's interesting here is one of the best ways, as, as Ben was just saying, one of the best ways as an investor to make money in inflation is to buy assets that have pricing power. And that could be, you know, Apple, Apple Inc., you know, which mm -hmm. they can raise the prices of their iPhones, just as an example. Um, it can also be your commercial real estate where you have pricing power. If you, as long as you can raise your rents or you can raise the prices of your product to keep pace with inflation, then that asset is going to go up. And in fact, during, you know, during the 1980s, you know, the stock market, you know, did well. And and um, and in fact, you know, over the over the last 40 years, um, while it, while a dollar, if 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 you could buy a cup of coffee for a dollar in 19 January 1st, 1980, 40 years later, that same cup of coffee costs you three dollars and thirty cents. So inflation went up, you know, basically 300 percent. But the stock market went up 83 times, 83 x versus versus the cup of coffee, which went up three x. So just just FYI, but so so let's say you have uh, you know you have a dollar to spend you or you have a cup of coffee to sell a year later that coffee costs a dollar seven today um, in today's you know it, right. at seven percent inflation if you have a dollar of savings that dollar a year later is worth ninety three cents okay so because so so the so deflation works two ways one it increases the value of uh, of of uh, the cost of an asset, and 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 it also uh, decreases the value of a dollar of uh, of cash, and so one of the greatest ways to make money in an inflationary environment is actually to borrow money at fixed interest rates. Right. So so this is what our government knows with the national debt. So so just here's here's the actual numbers at seven percent inflation. And we're at 7.5 right now, but at 7% inflation, if I have a hundred dollars in the bank today, in 10 years, that hundred dollars is worth $50. It drops 50% of its value. It's of its purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so the point, so I want to have as much of that as I possibly can of other people's money borrowed. So I pay them back with dollars that are worth a lot less mm -hmm. right so so let's let's look at this chart here so the the cre in an inflationary environment and you can see what ben is is talking about so let's say we bought a 10 million dollar apartment complex and it's worth 10 million dollars and uh and and um and that is priced on let's say it's a five cap right so it's got a net operating in income of x and but if that net operating income, if that's growing up every year with inflation, we're raising our rents according to inflation, that net operating income is increasing 7% per year per year. Divide by the cap rate, it means the value of that property is increasing. Yep. And in fact, it's extraordinary. So if you look at this chart, you can see then in, in in you know 10 years, that property is basically doubled in value by doing nothing. By doing absolutely nothing. And, and what I've done in this chart is theoretically, I've taken out a interest only loan for 10 years. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so we're paying out an interest only loan for 10 years, but the value of the what I owe, the per the value of the dollars that I owe actually de decreases every year because of inflation. The number may stay the same, but the value of it stays. The, so you're letting time pay off that loan for you. And so it has this outsized gain on equity so and the you know the last chart i want to show here shows this point is that 
is that so if a property value just just based on inflation a property value in five years would increase by 1.4x right to 1.4x in mm -hmm. 10 years 2.0x so the best value add strategy is inflation <laughs> right. if you want to do multifamily value add just buy inflation protected assets in 10 years you've got a 2x by doing absolutely nothing to that property but you have a 4.9 times 4.9x of your equity multiple in 10 years uh, simply because you're letting the value of that debt uh, uh, you're, you're benefiting from the value of that debt being being paid off as well. So 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 it's a it's a commercial real estate especially is going to have an out be an outsized benefactor of of uh, of of inflation. And I will point out, and as you pointed out, that the that there's the different asset classes um, are uh, different real estate classes are going to perform vastly different. Right. Um, so. So some of the some of the ones that are going to respond well to inflation that that have pricing power are self storage, yep. Okay, because you just raise rates, super easy. Very, you know, probably even they probably would could lag inflation by just you know a quarter even. Yep, is all. Um, commer uh, multifamily is gonna is gonna have a lot of pricing power, right? Because you yep. can raise rates. Maybe it lags by six months or a year, because you, you it takes you that long to raise to raise rents. Um, other other asset classes less so. So you know, office space is typically on you know five or ten, seven, ten year leases. Um, industrial much much less, you much less pricing power there. So over right. overall, they're going to do fine, but they have less pricing power. Same with with retail. So I, I think the the ones that are going to have the most the most uh, pricing power are are self storage and um, and um, and residential. Yeah. And, and just to underscore that point, you know what, what we've been talking about, even you were just on a, on a panel uh, last week at a conference, the best ever conference discussing, you know, what's the future of real estate, you know, this year. And as far as what's the transaction volume going to be, it's going to be a big buy year. It's going to be a big, big boom. And to your point here, if you can buy inflation protected real estate, which a lot of the real estate is with fixed rate debt, you are going to massively be successful and have a very be set up for right good success. And, and we do want to make this point: it isn't it isn't just multifamily that's going to do well. It's right. particular multifamily. Um, so what we're seeing today, um, a lot of these larger deals are being being driven. You know, prices are being dropped, driven up in multifamily, and the multiples, the 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 cap rates are being driven super low, especially in high demand markets. But in order to close these deals, a lot of these operators are 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 using you know. Um, um, bridge financing, bri bridge yeah. financing, which basically is is adjustable rate after three years. It has other terms, and this is not what you want to be doing in this environment. Um, so the worst case scenario in, in in a multifamily scenario like that is well, let's say let's say there is a cap rate adjustment that goes against you in three years. You know, I'm not expecting that, but if 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 there was, well, all of a sudden. You know, and maybe you've got an you know higher higher interest rate. You put that higher risk interest rate on. Well, now it actually reduces your net operating in, income, or you know, um, uh, significantly, and and you actually maybe will fail your debt service ratio covenant, right? right? And you could lose the property. Yeah. Um, but they're and they're doing it in order to close deals with less equity because the these bridge lenders allow um, you yeah, know higher leverage rates. higher leverage rates. And so, so it's it's not really something you want to be playing with. So you want to be very careful about the structuring of your deals and the and if you as an LP as an investor, you want to be very you want to be make sure that your uh, your operators understand the risks of of leverage and understand how this is going to play out in this inv inflationary environment. So it's not just getting in the right assets, but it's getting in the in the right assets that are structured well. Exactly. Yeah, so it's it's increasingly important. It's always important, but increasingly so now. Looking at deals you're investing in, what is the debt structure, and uh, to the extent you can invest in deals that are locking in interest rates now, those are going to be the ones that perform the best, that have the least amount of interest rate risk, um, and the chance that interest rates do adjust and reset at higher rates down yeah. the road. And just to make the point, you know, it's the same in the stock market. The companies that have pricing power. Are going to do actually track just fine with inflation. 
the, the companies that do not have pricing power will not track the same. Yes. And so, you know, Procter and Gamble, uh, which you know produces Pampers uh, and to and Crest toothpaste. I, I think they do at least. You know, <laughs> um, um, they're going to track just fine. Right. They'll raise. will raise the prices. So. Yeah. Um, c- companies that do not may not be able to raise prices. Uh, yep. So, so, and their stocks won't do as well. So it's the same thing. It, it bifurcates the economy into those with pricing power and those without pricing power. Yeah. So super important. So you want to walk through some of the asset classes and the data you've, you've. Yeah. So, so gathered? this is, this is super interesting. What about, what about, um, you know, I, I pointed out this the stock market was one of the outsized performers. So so if you had a dollar in January 1st, 1980, that dollar today, you know, w- what you could buy with that dollar would would cost you three dollars and 30 cents. OK, yes. Yeah, so inflation had increased by three X to your by three point three X in 40 years, three point three X. OK, so how about gold the gold, the ultimate in- inflation hedge? You know, how did gold do? Well, if you had bought an ounce of gold. January 1st, 1980, it would have cost you about 500, 500 bucks. And if you had to exit it 40 years later at, uh, you know, at, um, you know uh, 1231, 2019, that was about $1,500. So you would have made 3X on your money. So it, it basically, gold has not been, it's been, a, it's been a very disappointing asset class. And it has not even kept pace with inflation. So, you know, talking about the gold as a, as a inflation hedge, you know, it it's it sounds great, but it really has not been reality. It has not been a great inflation hedge. Um, now, a lot of people are, may may take issue with that and say, "Well, let's look at the '70s when we had very high inflation." But it's a little bit unfair because because uh, gold began the 1970s pegged to the dollar at thirty-five dollars an ounce, and so when it got unpegged, you know, it was then free floating right. for the first time in, in history. So yeah, it shot up, but that's not going to be repeated. It's not, and it's not, you can't really measure that as an inflation kind of me, uh, kind of metric. Right. So a, a lot of investors, you know, and, and us included, you know, up until, you know, really several years ago, I'm looking at the data again, you know, the assumption is that gold is the ultimate hedge um, against one volatility and two against inflation, right? Because it's viewed as an alternative currency. So if we're debasing the value of the dollar, then the gold will, you know, increase correspondingly. And, um, you know, especially in the real estate world, there's a lot of investors where they just believe gold is, you know, an equivalent asset class as far as, you know, value and, um, returns that you can get. And you know, it used to kind of be in that camp, you know, in the Austrian school of economics where kind of the hard money, um, school of thought where, um, you know, as you increase the money supply, you know, you can expect hyperinflation and, and gold is going to, uh, help prevent, um, the erosion of your, your value of your dollar. And so talk a little bit about kind of maybe your, viewpoints and how they they've changed over time. right yeah i was what you what you would call the Aust- of the austrian school the hard money school of economics um really until about 10 years ago and when i when i saw what happened in 2009 when the fed began monetizing the the the, the debt by buying treasury bonds and buying mortgage debt and i immediately thought like pretty much all the hard money guys that this was this meant the end and you see they're going to see the dollar collapse and you're going to see you know, hyperinflation, and it didn't happen. And, and so um, I really began to, to look at all the data again and, and re- rethink all my assumptions and, and came to some very different conclusions after that that are, you know, that, that I represent today. And, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing the, what, the, you know, this idea of, of inflation being tied only to M2 just isn't actually true. It, it's 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 not correct. The M the M2. Explain what M2 is for those who may not. It's the that. money supply. So a lot of people are saying, okay, we're the money supply is basically represents the the it's the it's the amount of liquidity in dollars, and as that increases without the equivalent GDP increasing. You, it's it's money printing and therefore it's inflationary. But but the but the M two has not is not been highly correlated to to inflation. So um, in fact, the M two in forty years has gone up ten x ten x. Inflation has gone up three three point three x in forty years. So you know so um, all this money printing has not resulted in high inflation. Right. 
Um, it has not. By the way, the, and then there's there's the argument that the dollar is going to be just be is going to be you know it's going to fail. The dollar is going to fail because of the money printing. Again, you see this in Argentina. They they print money and it destroys the value of the Argentine currency. But we're not Argentina. So 40 years ago, the dollar in the, the dollar is is measured by what's called the dollar index, which is the value of the U.S. dollar relative to a basket of foreign currencies, right? Um, and that dollar index 40 years ago was 85. The value of the dollar index 40 years later was 96. It went up. It went up. The dollar increased in value uh, by 1.2x during this, while while the value of the dollar, in fact, went down by 3.3. Right. So. So the point is the dollar index, or in other words, the dollar's value relative to other currencies is not as super correlated to, to um, uh, inflation and, and even, even money printing. Right. Um, so, and it makes sense because guess what? Everybody else is printing money too. So <laughs> <laughs> right. it's all relative. It, it, it's all relative. So, so t- talk a little bit about, and this is you know more of an aside, and we'll talk about this in future podcasts. But a lot of you know investors are concerned that if the dollar loses its status as the world reserve currency, well, that kind of changes the conversation, right? Because you know the if, if, it, if the dollar loses its status, and that is pretty impactful to um and, and that's 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 kind of i just it's hard to take that seriously to right. be honest and and I'll, I'll tell you the people that are propounding that view are people who are primarily invested in other countries right okay <laughs> as their as their main and their main bet on the future okay right. and they'll you know to be unnamed or maybe you should name them but but uh the dollar is reserve reserve status is not in any th- under any threat whatsoever. Yeah. So a, I believe it's eighty seven percent of global trade today is in U.S. dollars. Eighty seven percent, you know, and the idea and most the most people are saying the ascendant currency, of course, is the Chinese currency. But I remember back in the in the 80s, the most ascendant currency was the was the Japanese yen, and everybody believed we were going to be speaking Japanese, and right. we were going to all be transacting in yen, and it didn't happen. Um, and the idea that you're that you are going to instead go into your bank around the corner and deposit your money in Chinese yuan, you know, is ridiculous. This is a police state without democracy, under the control of a communist government, that without human rights. And even the, even, you know, that's really ridiculous. They are not going to be the global financial plumbing. They're simply not. Right. They're not ready for that. It's not going to happen in the next 10 years or the next 20 or the next 30. It's not going to happen. Yeah. What What is going to replace the, the dollar? Um, there's really nothing that could even come close. Europe is possible. But the, but the, the, the euro has structural problems as well. Um, they are more uh, of a hard money. Uh, they have hard, more of a hard money stance than than America does. They have less ability to print currency than America has. Um, so, if, for example, all all of the all of the member countries in Europe can can um, can uh, borrow money in euros, but they have no authority to print money. Right. And that's when you go broke. Is when you borrow money in a currency you can't print. <laughs> America, we we can we both borrow dollars and print dollars. So, um, you know, and, and let me make this point too about about inflation. One of the things that inflation does, as I made the point, it inflation is a massive transfer of wealth from savers to borrowers. Mm-hmm. Massive transfer of wealth from savers to borrowers. So, the one of the ways to get ahead is to be a big borrower. Okay, and that goes against some people's ethos. Well, you know, that is the way to get ahead. Well, who is the biggest borrower? Federal government. The federal (laughs) government. And they benefit massively. So if I said a dollar in your bank account in 10 years is worth 50 cents, well, it works for the federal government too. What they owe, the $24 trillion they owe in 10 years will, will, will be worth, you know, the buying power of that is half what it is today. So the taxes will go up, will, will be doubled by then just because of inflation right. alone. And the value of that debt is unchanged, if it is. And so, so in, in fact, most countries, you know, having debt to G, high debt to GDP ratios 
is quite often, uh, quite common, and de but default amongst um, countries is not common. And the reason is they simply can pay their debt off through inflation. And that's exactly what's happened. So America had a, a debt to GDP ratio right around 100 after World War II because mm -hmm. of all the borrowing. And, and guess what? We didn't default. It, in fact, that debt, while it never diminished, it simply, as a percentage of the GDP, it massively diminished. Right. So, so, so GDP is the gross domestic product. It's, it's the, pr the, the productivity of every single person times the population, right? And so GDP is going to increase with inflation. Yeah, especially when 70% of it is from consumer spending and there's $6 yeah. trillion. Dollars in yeah, <laughs> but, but even so the point is if, if there's pricing power for that Apple costs, costs you know 7% more, that iPhone costs 7% more than it did last year, well, that increases the GDP by that much. So as this pricing power works through the system, it also benefits GDP. So you see higher GDP growth as well. Yeah. And so the debt to GDP ratio, which is the most relevant kind of statistic, actually is diminished so that's all kind of hyper technical I, I hope that's not over your heads but <laughs> but you know it's I, I it's the, the point i think you should walk away with here is that one debt benefits or uh high inflation benefits debtors yeah. and and real estate as is perfect for that because it allows us to be large large debt holders as yep. long as we have you know uh fixed rate debt and um uh, uh, and then not to fear the collapse of the dollar, not, not to overinvest in gold, yep. not to worry about the M2 money supply. And, um, and really, I mean, the sentiment from that conference we were at, the best ever conference, hearing from several you know, big name economists and many others is that they really see a runway of at least you know, three to five years um, where the economy is going to remain strong. Um, and the consumer being as healthy as they are is really the foundational you know, underpinnings of that to drive GDP forward. And right. so, you know, again, you know, there's there's some trepidation and, and fear with, uh, you know, external factors going on in the market, but we just believe it's a very good time to be backing up the truck, buying good assets with, with good debt terms and, um, you know, using all these kind of pieces to our advantage um, as an inflationary environment. That's it. That's it. Well, hopefully these are some helpful thoughts for you guys. And we're going to be kind of doing more on this, these kind of topics. Um, and again, just helping educate investors. So if you guys are enjoying this podcast, we really appreciate any support you guys can give on um, iTunes or Spotify with the review and telling your friends about it and uh, really appreciate the support so far. So thanks for listening. Join us next time.